Hey, welcome to Crosspoint. We're so glad you've chosen to join us today. If it's your first time, we'd love to get to know you. Would you please fill out a Connect card? You can do so online or at our Welcome and Information Center. There's so many exciting things happening here at Crosspoint. Here are some announcements. Good morning, church. Good, good morning. morning, good morning. Remember what he's done. Remember what he's done. So good. Um, on that good note, my name is Josue, and this is my wife, Kristen, and we're so excited to be here with you today. Yeah, um, it's actually really nice to see the room full, so awesome that you guys are all here with us, and if you are new, we would love to get to know you and meet you, so you can scan the QR code on the seat in front of you, or come to the Welcome Information Center after service. It's just across the hall. We have a gift for you, so make sure you stop by. Yes. Sorry, I got distracted. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for laughing. So October 31st is coming so soon. I, um, the year has flown by and we're already in October. Uh, October 31st allows us to be able to uh, partner with each other and be able to have an outreach opportunity for all of us and have an event at our home and it's called Light the Night. So this event you could get creative and play a movie on your garage or grill or pass out candy or whatever it is that you want to do. But it allows your neighbors to come with you and uh, hear the light or hear the message, uh, be the light of, the, of Jesus in your community. But for that to happen, we also uh, take candy donations because we would like to supply those host, uh, those host sites, host houses. Uh, with some supplies, with a uh, sign for your lawn, some candy, some tracks, invite cards, things like that. So you may have noticed at the entrances, there's a couple of clear bins for candy donations. So not all of us can host the light the night as much as we would like to. Uh, so if you would like to partner with us and participate in a different way, you can drop off your candy donations at those bins. Yeah, and uh, drop them off by October 20th, right? Thank you. That's, I forgot yeah. that in first service. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I forgot that again. So October 20th is the last day for those candy donations. And also, like, let us know if you want to host. Um, you can sign up online if you want to host a Light the Night. Um, and then wow. we have an outreach meeting today, actually, after this service. It's in the bridge, which is the room the youth usually uh, meet in on Sundays. But... Uh, if you're interested in getting involved in local outreach or in mis missions trips that we have coming up, please come to that meeting. So it's right after this service in the bridge. There's a couple things happening also on Wednesday. We have Wednesday prayer, which is at 6.30 to 7. And then we have our Wednesday in the Word that starts at 7. And we are also getting the kids ready for the Christmas production happening. So... A lot of things are happening on Wednesday, but they're exciting things. Uh, Pastor Leaf has an actual number of how many people were here for prayer, and I thought that was really encouraging. So don't forget, a lot of things happening Wednesday, 6.30, prayer, 7, Wednesday in the Word, and at that same time is our uh, re rehearsal for Christmas productions. And then this month, we are offering two Sundays where we're doing baptisms. So we typically offer baptisms the third Sunday of the month, but we're actually going to be doing it this next Sunday, October 13th, as well as October 20th. So if you are new to the Lord or you're ready to take that next step in bat baptism, make sure you sign up and let us know you're interested. Uh, there are many ways to give of our tithes and offerings. We have by mail, in person, by texting, on the app or online. And you can do that. We do that to honor the Lord, um, and not just in obedience, but also in our trust in Him, that He will take care of it because He knows where things need to go and how to steward that. So we just thank you for your giving for that. And that's all the announcements we have. I know we have a lot. So if you have any questions, please come to the Welcome Information Center after service. And let's prepare our hearts for the message and let's watch this video. In a world that never stops moving, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. But within these walls, there's a place where everything changes. A place where Christ dwells, where rest is not just a feeling, but a gift. 
your home sanctified, blessed, and filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here, faith thrives. This home becomes more than walls and rooms. It is a sanctuary of rest, where your spirit finds peace and renewal. When Christ is the cornerstone, your home becomes a refuge, a place where burdens are lifted and hearts are healed. Let your home be the sanctuary it was meant to be, a place of rest, a house of peace. Invite him in and watch as your home becomes a haven for your soul. Your home is your sanctuary where faith and Christ dwells. Your home is a sanctuary of rest. All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good. I just thought that Josue and Kristen came up here and provided so much coolness and cuteness that how could I not come up without Pastor Joni? So uh, here's my wife, Pastor Joni. We're going to try to match the coolness of Josue and Kristen. Almost but, uh, impossible. But I don't think we can. No, we cannot. I don't think we can. Uh, well, thank you for being here at Cross Point Church. My name is Pastor Leaf. This is my wife, Pastor Joni. We are the pastors. We get the honor of being a part of such a great church family. We love this church family. And um, I'm excited. And personally, there's a meaningfulness to the series we're about to start for the month of October. We're going to be doing a series called House Rules. We're going to talk about how our homes are meant to be places where Christ dwells and faith thrives. That whether you're in a studio or an apartment, whether you live by yourself, whether you have roommates, whether you're empty nesters, whether your house is so full that every room's taken and there are even bunk beds, that your house is meant to be a place where God moves. Your house is meant to be a place where peace is deposited. Your house is meant to be a place where God does so much more than simply what we envision house life being like. You've heard it said that the church is not a building, the church is not Sunday morning, that the church is God's people, and I want to encourage you that one of the places faith can happen most and happen best is in the home. And so we are up here together to start this series because Pastor Joni will be teaching it, I will, and we are not up here because our home life is perfect. What? We, what? What? We don't do everything perfectly. I mean, I'm just glad there's not a big brother camera in our house all the time. But I'm thinking about this phrase, um, honey. Um, how many of you have heard this phrase, and it's meant to reassure us, it's meant to bring hope and comfort, God knows your address. Have you ever heard that phrase? God knows your address. That means he knows your comings and goings. He knows your thought processes. He knows your most difficult season. He knows your greatest desire. He knows what you care about most. And God knows your address. And I think one of the things about our, our house and house rules is we need our addresses to know God. Isn't that true? How many of you have like scripture art in your house? You have a scripture somewhere in your house. Raise your hand. Now, some of us not only have scripture art, some of us, when we leave the house, we, even if no one's there, worship music is playing because this is God's house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So this month, we're going to be today looking at our house as a sanctuary of rest where we dwell in God's presence and we receive. We're going to be looking at our house as a welcoming place where we greet people and serve people. We're going to be looking at our house as a training ground, a place where we champion and celebrate and shape the people in our house, not just our kids, but one another, that we're celebrating and encouraging one another. And I want you to know the final one. I'm so excited at the end of the month. Our house can be a miracle center where the infilling and outpouring of the Holy Spirit can happen. I'll just give you a preview of that last month. I asked the Lord for weeks and weeks when I first got saved, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I had such a passion for it that I got filled, but I wanted the gift of speaking in tongues. I wanted to pray in my spiritual language. And I would ask for it in a Sunday service. Week after week, I asked for it, didn't get it. I received my spiritual language in my parents' bedroom, praying. After all the prayers at church, so God can move. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my commands, and my Father will love them, and we will go to them and make our home with them. So today I want to set you up. Pastor Joni is going to stay up here for a couple minutes. We're going to have a little conversation. 
But I want to set up 2 Samuel 6 is where we're going to be today as we're talking about a sanctuary of rest. David has just become king. It's in 2 Samuel 5. After years of waiting on the promise from the prophet Samuel, after years of adversity and hanging in there and running for his life from his father-in-law, King Saul, David is finally king in 2 Samuel 5, and a big deal is about to happen. No, he's not throwing out the first pitch at the Dodger game. That's not what's happening. But what he's doing is he's bringing the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, back to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant was a very big deal, and it represented God's presence, God's victory, God's promise, God's provision, and His power. And this would be one of the most precious possessions that Israel had up until this point. And he's going to bring it back to Jerusalem. And in his excitement, he makes a wrong move. In his excitement, he rushes things. And there's consequence. And we're going to look today at, at what happened and how we can learn to have a sanctuary of rest in our home. So would you join me in 2 Samuel 6 as Pastor Joni reads the text. Starting in verse 9. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Can everybody say three months? I want you to remember that. That's a key phrase, three months. So point number one, rest is a command. Rest is a command. The ark rested in the house of Obed-Edom, and for three months, everything in his house was blessed. Would you like everything in your house to be blessed? Would you like your neighbor's music to go down a little? Would you like the barking to stop? Would you like your kids to go to bed when it's bedtime? Like, you know, Joni and I were night owls, which means like 9.30, we're asleep. And our kids will be downstairs, they're watching TV, they're be quiet. But God wants to do something, and there's a command called rest. We live in unnerving chaos. We live in changing and challenging times. We live with circumstances that sometimes feel too big and too hard to endure. We are going through a lot in our journey. There is an unnerving chaos. There are changing times. There are things that are unsettling. Things are changing all the time, and it's hard to keep up. Have you heard of this word? It happens in California a lot. Inflation. I went to get two bags of groceries, not even full at Ralph's, $79. It's like, what is going on? And there's this unnerving chaos. There are these challenging situations. The times are always changing. And I'd like to say to you that we do not simply need the precious commodity of rest. We need to view it as a matchless necessity for our lives. That we need a sanctuary of rest. When Joni and I and many of the pastors on our team will get asked to go to someone's new house to pray a blessing over their home. And we'll go and, get, and go to pray a blessing on their home. And what we do is we go into all the rooms. And if the family has kids, it's even better because we have the kids get involved. Kids, come on, come on. And we'll go to the kitchen and we'll pray something. And we'll go to the living room and we'll pray another thing. We'll pray at the front door one thing. But when we get to the master bedroom, there's a prayer I pray. Lord, may this room be marked by sweet sleep. Lord, may this room have some of the best conversations in it. May this room have quality times with God in worship and prayer and worship. May this room feel like a shelter that is safe, like an oasis that you can draw from. And if it's a married couple, I pray, Lord, give them the best conversations and give them some of the most intimate connection here in this room. Psalm 62.5 says, Yes, my soul, find rest in God, for my hope comes from him. One of the people that I think does rest the best and dwelling with the Lord and making her home a sanctuary is my wife, Pastor Joni. You know, we get up early, and she's always downstairs reading the Bible, writing prayers, journaling. Pastor Joni, how do you just set up your space with four kids and a dog and just life's demands? And um, everyone's always so quick to help you at home, right? I know. It's living the dream. <laughs> um, but I, I learned it a long time ago um, when I was a missionary in South Africa because I had not really grown up 
reading the Bible, that once I started reading the Bible, I just, there was so much I gained from it. I, I, and so I remember going to bed at night in my little room in Willowvale, um, Trans Sky, South Africa, and um, I couldn't wait to get up in the morning to read his word. And I have just, I still just can't wait. I, sometimes, well, it's a little different now at times, but when I get up, I am so delighted that every day that I go to his word, I am never disappointed. Mm. And um, his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And that, uh, almost every time I'm in his word, there is a word that that just really speaks to me of the season that I'm in. So um, one of our pastors said once, don't ever go to bed without reading at least one verse in the Bible. So I'm going to tell you all, don't go to bed without reading at least one verse. And in that word will dwell within you richly, and it will not return void. Thank you, honey. Thank you so much. We love you. So this series, I mentioned how meaningful and personal it is for me because I grew up in a home that was anything but restful, anything that but sanctuary, anything but Christ-centered. I had a parent who was alcoholic, bipolar, and a pathological liar. So to say that our house was unpredictable day in and day out, season in and season out, to say that our house was toxic, that there was challenge, that there was struggle, to say that our house was frantic would be an understatement. It was a place where arguing never ended in peace. It was silence for days and arguing louder. It was a house that was marked by fighting and cussing and holding grudges was what our family was best at. And we lived in a chaotic home. I can remember at four years old looking through my bedroom. I was the oldest. And my mom would be so drunk that she would be in a fight wrestling with her girlfriend in the house. I can remember a house where Christmas could flip on a switch just with one comment and turn Christmas from the most joyous time to a hard time. So my house life was tough. It was not easy. And it's so much even more meaningful to preach on the home being a place where God shows up. And I I just want you to know, I, I think God can show up in so many ways. And he wants to get our attention. And he wants us to see him in our home. And we have to just be careful that we we don't lose sight. So I saw this funny Facebook silly post. I just want to show it to you. This guy says, slept very poorly last night. And to make matters worse, as a weird coincidence, everyone was being annoying today. So slept bad, woke up, everyone's being a jerk, everyone's being difficult, and it's a coincidence, but because this person slept poorly, everything was going wrong, everything was breaking down, everyone was a bother, everything was an irritant. David, I shared how he was excited He had the ark of God he was bringing back to Jerusalem. This is a big deal. I'll talk about the ark in about 10 minutes. But the ark of God was a big deal. And in his excitement, his expectation, the significance of what it meant, he rushed and did not follow the rules God had placed. He rushed himself. So what should have happened, and God had given very clear instructions in the book of Numbers, that the ark was not to be touched. It was holy, Do not touch the ark under any circumstance. The Levites, the priests, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, they were commissioned to carry the ark. They had to make poles. And you'd put the poles through the holes and the bearings, and they would carry the ark across wherever it went. Remember that um, from Egypt to promised land, Moses and the people would go, and they would build a tent, a tabernacle. The tabernacle represented God's presence. But we haven't gotten to the place yet where God's going to where um, um, David wanted to build a temple. He wanted to build a temple for the Lord in Jerusalem, but the Lord said, you can't build a temple. You're a man of war. You have blood on your hands. Your son Solomon will build a temple. That will represent where my presence is. I don't really need that house, but I will be with you, and I will bless you, and I will dwell there. So now we have the ark, and the ark was not to be touched. And in David's excitement, rush of emotions, rush of excitement, he oversteps the rules. And someone loses their life. It's a pretty hard consequence. 
Now, you may say, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Because Uzziah, he was just probably re- reacting. He was good intention. Like, if something's falling, isn't the reaction to try to catch it, try to stop it, try to save it? So he reached out to touch it, but the whole thing was out of order. And I think sometimes God wants to say, sometimes I'm going to be pretty hard on the consequence. Because if you can't follow this simple command, don't touch this, there's a way to carry it. What are you going to do when this sins at your doorstep? When this choice is at your doorstep, when this opportunity is at your doorstep, I actually don't think it's Uzzah's fault at all. I think it was David's fault. He was the king. He knew the rules. And something got him rushed. And he got so afraid. He said, I got to take the ark. We can't. uh, This is distraughtful for me. Let's take the ark to Obed-Edom's house. And it's in Obed-Edom's house. And God blesses everything in his house. What a powerful picture that where God's presence is, something powerful happens and transpires. So this week, I was sick most of the week. I had to cancel appointments. I had some great appointments planned. I was supposed to go play golf on Friday, and thankfully for the foursome that would have been with me, they got someone else, a better golf player than I am, because I'm not great at golf. But I had to cancel my appointments. I canceled a golf tournament for a charity, an organization I really love. But, you know, the, the, the pastor in me, the strong guy in me was like, you know, I could probably make it a couple of days at church. I could probably go over there. And all of the pastors and staff, you know, they were so gracious. They're like, Pastor Leaf, you don't have to come. What they really wanted to say was, come on, big dummy, don't get everyone else sick. Do you know what's interesting about rest? Our bodies tell us that we need rest. Our minds tell us we need rest. Others tell us we need rest. God told us we need rest one day a week. You know who does not listen to rest? Us. People are telling us to rest. Our body is telling us to rest. Our mind is telling us to rest. God is telling us to rest. And here I am thinking I know better than God and everyone else. I'm going to just push through. I'm just going to do things the way I've always done them. Rest is a blessing, church that keeps us from breaking down or becoming puffed up. Rest is a blessing that keeps us from breaking down and being puffed up. We are living such frantic lives, aren't we? Always on our phone. Always needing to quickly respond to someone else without thinking about what to write. Waiting. Sometimes thinking that we're the source and the sustainer of someone else's well-being. When we can be a help, we could be a support, but we're not the source and sustainer. Sometimes we're frantic and neurotic about our finances and our bills. We struggle, we struggle with the chaos in our mind, in our workplaces, in our family life. Just between the service, talk to someone moving and it's stressful. Talk to someone whose father got diagnosed with cancer, super stressful. Talk to someone whose grandmother just passed away, stressful. There's stresses, there's burdens, there's weights, and it it consumes us. Listen to 1 John 3, 19 and 20. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. Watch this next phrase. And how he has set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. I love that it says that he set our hearts at rest in his presence. I want to be a person that learns to get set in his presence. I want to be a person who's surrounded. Do you remember when the Bible says he surrounds his people with songs of deliverance? How many would like that song sung over you? I mean, I love our worship team. They're amazing. But I would, I mean, as as much as I love Pastor Charlie and Karina and Ryan and everyone on our worship team, If the Lord's going to sing a song of deliverance on me, over me, and surround me with that, man, I'm in. I need that. What's the opposite of rest? Is it being on edge, tense, wound up, disgruntled, depleted? I wonder how often our lives are just rattling out of control and there's instructions we need to receive. I had this phrase. I didn't write it down. I don't know if they put it on the screen. It was a great phrase. It was something God really spoke to my heart this week as I was preparing. So let me share it with you. I'll say it a couple times. You can write it down. The greater lengths we go without rest, the greater lapses of error we'll have in our lives. Let me say that again. The greater lengths we go without rest, the greater lapses of errors we'll have in our lives. 
We will make poor decisions. We will misinterpret what people say. We'll be irritable. We will be uh, sometimes delusional. We will struggle. Our bodies can break down. Our frame of thinking can break down. When we have lengths without rest, the littlest lie from the enemy, the littlest temptation, the littlest accusation can send us off course. But to make matters worse, please hear this, when we don't rest, the good words of God, the comforting words of the Holy Spirit, the encouraging words from one another, we can't even hear or receive because I'm not in a place of rest. So you don't really mean that. God can't really mean that. When he says, there, therefore, now is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, he can't really mean that because I am so worn down, beat up. I can't just look at me. I'm struggling. And when we don't rest, the lapse of error, the lapse of judgment. I mean, how many of us, we've made a really great decisions when we're super emotional? How many of us make great decisions super emotional on 3 a.m.? Like, we don't make great decisions when we don't have rest. We need to learn to rest. When we rest, we can actually receive the good, receive the encouragement, receive truth. We can begin to reject the things that are wrong. When we don't rest, the longer we go without rest, the lapse of error chance is greater. Someone can ask you the simplest question, the simplest request, you just closed the fridge. You got out some milk. You're two steps up, up the stairs. Hey, honey, can you get me some milk too? Oh my gosh. I've traveled a whole 20 feet in two steps. But right, when we're, when we're tired, when we're exhausted, when we're burdened, we make everything the biggest deal possible. That's not because we are so, are we really that lazy? We can't go 20 feet back. No, because our spirit and our soul is not in a place of rest. Does anyone understand what I'm talking about? I mean, like, this is really good, guys. This is really good stuff. Like, there's rest that we need. We need rest. We get so irritable. Even when we don't rest, someone can compliment us, and we look at them sideways. What did you mean by that? What do you really want? Are you talking to me? Listen to Proverbs 23, 3 and 4. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Do you see that? How many would you like your faith to be filled with rare and beautiful treasures? I mean, that God, by wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it's, it's furnished. All the rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. He is our surrounding. He is our shelter. He is our covering. I'm going to say something super corny, and you're just going to have to get over it. I'm going to say it anyway. May God's love comfort you more than your favorite chair in your house. May God's peace be a gift to you greater than when you finally get to lay your head down on the pillow and go to sleep. May God's care be greater than the property insurance you pay for way too high and they don't help you when something breaks down. May God's truth be so vivid to you that the latest technology of flat screens, surround systems, phones can't even match the vividness of what God's doing. He wants to move in our lives. Corey Ten Boom says it this way. If you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. So rest is a command. Number two, presence is a gift. In verse six, it says, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. One translation says he blessed everything in the house, not just everyone, but he blessed everything in the house. The ark, I've already mentioned, was holy. And the ark was that key transportation piece. It represented God's presence. Now, what was in the ark gets, should get us really excited. Are you ready to get excited? All right. Well, that was pretty good, 11 o'clock. We're ready to get excited. There are three things in the ark that represent the fullness of God's truth. Everybody say truth. The fullness of God's care. Everybody say care. And the fullness of God's provision. Say provision. There are three things in the ark that represent the fullness of truth, care, and provision. First, in the ark are the Ten Commandments. Do these and live. Love God, love your neighbor. I mean, the Ten Commandments. 
The ones that Moses received on Mount Sinai when he was 40 days up on the mountain, that God took the tablets of stone, cut them, inscribed them. Moses comes down the mountain. He sees Israel worshiping a golden calf. They're having a sin party, not a good party, a sin party. Moses gets so upset, he breaks the tablets. God says, come back up here. I'm going to rewrite them. That's in the ark. Truth. In the ark is Aaron's staff with budded leaves. The staff, remember when uh, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, why should I let your people go? How can you prove that your God is really God? And Moses, they threw the staff on the ground. It turned into a snake. Pharaoh's magicians throw the staffs down too. They turn into snakes. Ooh, snakes everywhere. But Aaron's rod, the snake eats all the other snakes. The, The rod... The staff was a shepherd's staff to lead people. Israel, a million people, 40 years from from Egypt to Canaan to the promised land. There comes a time in number 17 where God's had enough of the murmuring, the arguing, the backbiting, the unrestfulness, the unpleasantness. Why is Moses in charge? Why is Aaron in charge? So God says this, choose one person from each of the 12 tribes, have them bring a staff. The staff that I cause leaves and flowers to birth out of. That's the shepherd you're to follow, and you should stop mumbling. That is in the ark, ultimate care. The final thing in the, in the ark, are you ready for the final thing? Isn't this good? All right, I hope you like it. Is the golden jar filled with manna. Forty years, he fed them manna. God sent manna, the food of angels, and the manna is in the ark. So where God is, grace is. Where he resides, fullness occupies. Psalm 84, 1 and 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faiths for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Church family, those watching online, can I just say this? Selecting the right house is important. Has there, is there anything as stressful as selecting a house? Talk to a couple engaged getting married. Talk to Joni and I when we said yes to this awesome assignment of being the pastors at Crosspoint. How, finding a house was stressful. Finding a house is stressful. And the selection of a right house is important. The backyard, the neighborhood, the, the price point, the square footage, the number of rooms. The selection of the house is important. But far more important is the invitation of the right person to that house. And the right person's name is Jesus. Is that true? That the right person being invited into your home is way more important than a studio apartment or a five-bedroom apartment. Way more important than living close to work or far from work. Way more important than the city living or suburbia. It's about inviting the right person. I got to tell you, real estate searching, when you go on the websites... Have you ever gone to the websites looking for homes or looking for a place to rent or buy? If it only shows one picture, I'm not even going there. Like when it shows the one picture and nothing else, you're like, something's up with that place. They're not telling the whole truth. Now, some of you fixer-uppers, some of you entrepreneurs, you love that. You're all over that. It's a deal. For me, I'm just going to say, uh-uh. I'm not going there. But I want to find the place where Christ was. Ephesians 3.17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, that Christ dwells in you and with you. And that's the best living space to be in. We celebrate communion, where we got to partake of his body, the representation of his body, the representation of his blood shed. And we got to partake. In fact, did you know that the disciples at the Last Supper, you know what they were doing? It says they and Jesus were reclining at the table. They weren't sitting upright. They were actually relaxed. They were abiding. They were resting. In fact, they were resting so much that John, who wrote John 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in Revelation, it says he was laying on Jesus' chest. There was a rest. And there's something about this rest. When we prayed this past Wednesday, our first Wednesday night ever having Wednesday night prayer, we had 35 people in this room just calling on the Lord and praying. And it was powerful to be in God's presence and say, we're setting aside this time to pray. You know, communion, we took it a little bit ago. I got to tell you, this is my least favorite wafer type of communion to taste. It tastes like styrofoam. Not that I eat styrofoam, but that's what I envision styrofoam tasting like. It's my least favorite to taste. I got to tell you, it's my most favorite when I think about Jesus. Because whenever I have this wafer and we have this type of wafer at church, I like to go in the middle and just press it as hard as I can. 
I press it. Jesus' body was not broken. And I press it as hard as I can. Our Savior was ridiculed, mocked, beaten, thorn of crowns, whipped. He was pressed. Paul says we are pressed, but not crushed. Persecuted, but not in despair. I just press this as hard as I can. I've been pressing it. You can see my vein. I'm pressing it. It doesn't break. This is my least favorite to taste, but it's my most favorite to remember everything Christ did. Isaac Walton says it this way, God has two dwellings, one in heaven and the other in a meek and thankful heart. Of course, God is omnipresent. He can dwell wherever he wants, but he chooses to dwell in heaven. He chooses to come and reside in our hearts. I told you that this message was super meaningful and personal for me, personal, this whole series, House Rules, a, a place where Christ dwells and faith thrives. I got to tell you, it went up another notch when I read, read verse 11. It says that the ark was brought into the home of Obed-Edom, and for three months, and God blessed him and everything in his home. And I felt like the Lord wanted you to know that in his presence, there is new life, there is true life, and there's abundant life. Three months, his house was blessed. Everybody say three months. We are in October, October, November, December, the last three months of 2024. For businesses, the fourth and final quarter, often a make or break time. And I saw this verse that for three months his house was blessed. And I'm just here to let you know, may the last three months of 2024 have victory in your life. May the last three months of 2024, you see some perfect timing because you've waited a long time in these nine months. In 2024, these last three months, may there be answers, may there be open doors, may there be a whole bunch of new stuff, even where you feel like your heart has become stale, that there would be new things happening in our life. May these last three months be some of the best in your job, career, and finances. May these last three months be some of the best in your marriage that nine months ago you thought was ending in divorce, in your relationship with your kids who you thought would never reach out to you again because they haven't answered emails or texts for six months. Please hear this last one. May these last three months be some of the best. Some of you, you're with a loved one who this is their last chapters here on earth. Maybe sickness, maybe age, I don't know. But may these three months be some of the best with them. I, I just really feel that sense that God wants you to know that these three months can be some of the best of increasing joy levels, faith levels. These can be some of the best months in terms of your time with God. These can be some of your best months in the church family. Some of you are here today, and this was your, you were giving God one last chance. Some of you, it's your first time here, and you're like, what's going on? But some of you are here for the, you were going to make this your last time. Don't give up. May these three months be some of the best. Psalm 1, 18, 15 said, shouts of joy and victory resound from the tents of the righteous. I just need someone to know in the room as we're getting ready to close the message. If your battle has been fierce, you know what that means? The stakes must be great. And if the stakes must be great, the victory will be amazing. Someone needs to hear that again. Some of us are going through battles that are fierce. We got a call in the middle of the night or a text that someone from our church is in the hospital. So we're, we're praying. We're trying to figure out how to love and support and pray. If you're in a fierce battle, don't wave the white flag against your enemy. You can wave it to surrender to Jesus. If the battle is fierce, please hear this. It must mean the stakes are great, and that must mean the victory will be amazing. I was 19 years old. I had bought my second car, a white Ford Escort. I didn't know much about cars, and no one ever trained me. I didn't, you know, we're going to talk about our home as a training ground in a couple weeks. And I knew you had to change the oil, but I didn't know much else about cars. I knew you put gas in. I had payments. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm 19. I'm cool. I... I've got a job that pays me not enough, but I'm good. I'm here. And pretty soon after about six months, the car started shaking. 
It started rattling. Every time I drove, went, if I went too fast or, I, or I, I, I hit the brakes, it would shake. It would bump. It would bump. I'm like, what is going on? I finally got tired of it, and I went out and looked, and each of the tire where the tread was, it was rippling. It was lifting up. The tread had become like, it just raised up, and I'm like, what has happened? I, I, I bump it to Galpin Ford, where I bought the car from, because a lot of people from the church bought it there. I go in to see the person who sold me the car, and he brings me a general manager. I say, hey, look, look at my tires. I've only had the car six months. What's going on? Um, they go, when was the last time you rotated the tires? I'm like, what's that? I mean, I know it sounds foolish, but that's what happened. Like, I don't know. I've never rotated the tires. No, you're supposed to rotate the tires, like, every time you get an oil check. Really? I'm like, oh, man. So I have a car payment. I can't afford four new tires. The general manager goes, hey, come with me. And if you've ever been to Galpin Ford and Van Nuys, they take me through this restaurant. It's called the Horseless Carriage. I'm like, what is going on? There's a little boardroom, like a conference room. I'm like, am I about to meet the Godfather? What is happening here? They open the door, and there's a conference meeting happening. And, and at this time, Galpin was the largest auto dealership in America. It might have been for many years. The door opens, and the owner is sitting at the head of the table having a meeting. His name was Bert Bachman. He looks at me, and he goes, hey, um, I forgot the na- guy's name. I think it was Don. Hey, Don, what's going on? Um, hey, this is one of our new customers, Leaf. He just bought a car here six months ago, and he, he's having a problem. Hey, what's going on, Leaf? Um, my tires are ruined. Well, what happened? I didn't rotate them. Uh, You know, like, I didn't know what to say. Just tell the truth. And he's looking at me, and he goes, are you at church on the way? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, hey, Don, go get those tires replaced. We'll pay for them. See, you just need to get in the right room. You just need to get to the person who has authority. You need to get to the person who has the answers and the resources. So when we go and pray through a house, here's how I'll end. We pray through a house. We pray through every room. You'll hear about the other rooms next time. But we get to the front door, back to the front door. I've done all the praying, or Joni, or Pastor Michelle and Tyler. But when I get to the door before I leave, we stand at the door, and, I, and it, whether it's one person or it's a whole family, and I'll say, I want you to pray. I've done all the praying, but I want you to pray. Because I'm about to leave, but this is where you live. I may be an instrument that God uses, but God's presence wants to indwell in this place. So I always ask the person who owns the house, let's close this out in style. Let's close this out right. Pray for your desire in this house. Pray for God to meet you in this house. Pray for the authority he's given you in this house. Pray, pray, pray. This is your house. Build your house on the rock, Jesus. Serve Jesus all the days of your life and see what God does in this house. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this time. I want to thank you for each of my friends. Lord, thank you for moving and stirring in our hearts and lives. Thank you for working. I thank you, Lord, for pouring out your spirit even now. And Lord, for my friends in this room, I pray that you would bless them. You would fill them. You would encourage them. You would help them. If their mind is racing, slow it down. If their heart is frantic, may they open it to you. If their circumstances are too many to count, may they, each circumstance be met with the blessings from heaven. If you're in this room, my friend, and really you've heard God speak through this message, you've heard the Holy Spirit, and you know that the command of rest is for you. Everyone, your body's telling you, your mind's telling you, God's telling you, but you need to receive rest. If you know you need rest, would you just put your hand on your heart? Just put your hand on your heart. Just receive rest for a moment. Jesus, I pray for my friends that they would receive the rest that comes from heaven only. Then in Jeremiah 6.16, God spoke to his people and said, I will show you the ancient paths and the good ways to walk. I will lead you in a way that is right so that you can find rest. We know, Lord, that in Jeremiah 6, the people of Israel refused that rest and there were more consequences. But we are going to be a new people today and we're going to receive that rest in Jesus' name. If you're in this room, eyes closed, and you need to receive Jesus as Savior, what does that mean? It means you believe that he is the Son of God. You want to open your heart to life in him. You want to receive forgiveness of sins. You want to be brought near to God, made new. This is just a starting part of the journey. 
It's called walk by faith, not by sight, but it has to start somewhere. Just like a baby goes from not being able to move very much to crawling to walking, there's got to be a starting point. And Jesus said it this way, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who's in heaven. It's not about how old you are. It's not about how rich you are. It's not about how many times you've been to church. Do you want to receive the gift that will never fail? Do you want to receive his presence that will never leave you? Do you want to receive his life that never ends? Would you just look up at me right now? Online, type yes. But if you're in the room, just look up at me. If that's why you're looking, I agree with you. Just lift your hand just for a moment. No one else is looking. Wow, so many hands are going up. One and two and three. I agree with you. Three. I agree with you, my friend back there. Thank you for looking up. I agree with you, young man. I I am so excited. Sir, I agree with you. If that's why you're looking at me, I agree with you that today you start that relationship with God. My friend right there, yes, I see you. I agree with you. Anyone else, just look up or raise your hand if I'm not seeing you. Yeah, thank you for lifting your hand. I see you. Yeah, thank you for lifting your hand, young one. That's an awesome decision. Anyone else, just look up. Don't want to miss this moment. Thank you, Lord. I, yeah, I agree with you. Thank you for being brave. Thank you for not waiting too long. It's never too late. We have breath in our life. Let's give our life to Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Yeah, I agree with you too over there. Yeah, thank you. Amen. Church, can we just celebrate? Can we just celebrate life? There's going to be people in a moment that are going to be up here to pray with anyone who needs prayer for anything today. If you receive Jesus, we want to give you a Bible. We we have a new life class starting in November, but we're believing for God to do amazing things in our lives together and in our homes. Would you just say, I surrender? Just say it one more time. I surrender. I surrender. Let's worship the Lord. Something isn't adding up This wild exchange you offer us I gave my worst, you gave your blood Seems hard to believe You're telling me you chose the cross You're telling me I'm worth that much If that's the measure of your love, how else would I sing? But completely, deeply, sold out, sincerely abandoned. I'm completely, freely, hands to the ceiling, enamored. My to match your surrender to mirror not my will but yours I'm completely deeply don't care who sees me abandoned oh I surrender all I just can't get over it What kind of self-control is this? You had angels at your fingertips But on the cross you remain I can't repay this kind of love But I can praise with everything I've got since death it all is power on just like the
breath in my lungs Consider it yours, Lord Consider it yours, Lord The failures I hide The victories I don't Those battles I fight Those crown that I hoard Consider it One more time. Amen. 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 If you need prayer, we'll have our prayer team up here ready to pray. Amazing women and men who want to pray with you. If it's your first time, we have a welcome center right across the way. We have a gift for you. Find out more about the church. Get connected. We're glad you're part of this service, and we'd love for you to be a part of this family. Wednesday night, prayer at 6.30, study through the book of Acts at 7. We have an outreach and missions interest meeting in about 10 minutes in the bridge. As you go from this place, receive his peace. Walk in his rest. See amazing life results. And that as you experience rest, someone driving slow is not going to bother you. Your neighbor's music is not going to bother you. Even your house that you thought needed a new paint and a bigger room, it's going to start feeling like it fits perfectly and that there's new things happening because God has been invited to your home and his promise of rest and his victory results will come. God bless you, church. Have a great day. We love you. Wow, what an awesome message. I hope you were blessed as I was. And if you received Jesus today for your first time, let me be the first to congratulate you. And if you're interested in your next steps, or if you're interested in connecting or giving, you can find those links here below. Thank you again for joining us today, and God bless.